in Exodus chapter 17. We're only going to take one story. It's only uh, seven verses we'll be looking at this morning. But, you know, during our vacation, I got a text from uh, Larry that was talking about your generosity from last Sunday with helping out Mercy Projects and uh, buying those cows. And so uh, um, from uh, Calvary Marietta, I was going to say, from Calvary Murrieta. You guys did an awesome job with, with providing for all those and all of the, the amount of families that are being sponsored now. What I was thinking of, first thing that came to my mind is, oh my gosh, in one Sunday, you guys fulfilled all five of our vision statements. Now, we haven't shared our mission, motto, vision, and values in a while. We're gonna be doing that in a little bit, but or soon. Um, I see I just messed up my S in the word instruction. But anyways, those are them before. And as I just kind of quickly ran through the list, I was thinking instruction. That, that we come to this book, we read it, but not just for the reading of it, not just for sticking it up in our head, not just for memorizing, but to actually live it out. And you did that. The partic- participation, you used their... You, use your unique ministry gifts and you found that and did that in participating in that and with character that what takes place is God is trying to transform us resulting in genuine fruit we already talked about that fruit Uh, stewardship generous hearts in putting your time talents and especially your treasures in building his kingdom and then in relationships encountering God as we center our affections on Christ sharing his grace and mercy of all people sharing his grace and mercy and people you'll probably never meet over in Armenia, over in uh, Ukraine, unless you go on one of the trips with, uh, with Jeff. You'll probably not meet them, but you've invested in their lives and it truly becomes a, a community of faith. That is our community of faith at Calvary Murrieta. And that's exactly what God was forming in the book of Exodus. He was looking for a community of faith. He wants a group to be a part of his, his family. In Exodus, especially in chapter 13 and 19, is about a relationship between God and his newly redeemed people. And so what we we notice is there's really not much of a stark contrast between the Israelites that we're studying about from 3,500 years ago and us today. We might have thought there was, but there's really not. And we understand that there's this one people group that God is calling out. To, the, to be his sons and his daughters, to be part of his family. Not two, just one. We've, in the New Testament, been grafted into that first family, if you will, of the Jews. And so we started as that for them to be a kind of a, a spotlight, put the spotlight upon them as of his people. And in the New Testament, we see that, in fact, we're, we become grafted into that group. So it's one people. He's always had one means of deliverance. We see in the New Testament, God saves us, by grace through faith. But did you know this in the Old Testament that the Israelites were saved by grace through faith? Not by the law. There has never been one soul ever saved from the law or by the law, by keeping the law. Never once. That's not what the law was for. We're going to talk more about that when we get to chapter 20 when the law comes and we'll talk about what it is exactly for. As God is delivering Israel out of Egypt... We recognize this is a picture of God's deliverance of his people from their sin. And the New Testament just continues on and carries that idea forward. And so we continue to read of these similar situations that Israel found themselves in and that we continue to face today. It's no different. And so we're going to be reading the story of, uh, put my title up uh, behind us here, is Where is God? It's the water from the rock. It's a simple story. You don't need to understand Hebrew to get through it. It's a very simple story of a, about two million people thirsting to death in the, in, the, in the desert there. And instead of crying out and praying to God, we need water. Instead, we'll see their response and what they do. God's going to give them that water with Moses taking his staff, hitting the rock, water gushing out, end of story. But it's not the end of the story. Let's read the story. Exodus 17, 1, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? And why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water And the people grumbled against Moses and said, here's their second statement, they make three. Second statement, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? 
So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. And then he says this, God says this in verse 6, Behold, I'll stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. And let's remind ourselves, Sinai is part of a mountain range. That mountain range is called Horeb, okay? And so that's one of the peaks of this Horeb. So they're getting very close to Sinai. That's where they're heading to, and that's where God will give Moses the Ten Commandments, okay? So that'll be chapter 20. And so we're getting very close to that, so we're in the same mountain range. We're at Horeb there, but I don't want you to miss what God just said. He says, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock. And water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Masa, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling. Because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? For my keynote, I'm always looking, being images, and, and trying to find, you know, what, what kind of... Uh, um, paintings were you know made in the last couple thousand years of of this and and one of them had <laughs> this figure laying up on the up on top of the rock there who's kind of laying and Moses is down there and he's striking the rope and I'm going who's the guy on the rock and it was you know as you read a story a number of times I'd never seen that before I never knew that God was sit, sitting him up on the rock I actually think it was Jesus we'll talk about that a little bit later but there is God showing his presence being there Let's look at uh, what's, what's happening here. Actually, we'll kind of start with the, the, the very last thing is, is the Lord among us or not? That's, that's the question. Other ways that we kind of rephrase it is where is God or where was God as we look back to the time in our life where something happened to us and we're just going, you just leave me all alone? Like, where were you? Why did you allow this to happen in my life? We've experienced that. We all have. And we know others that are dealing with it maybe even right now. And so let's start with this. This is a hard question to answer when it doesn't feel like, when you feel like you're going to die, you're, 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 you're going to, there you are in the desert and you're, you're not going to be able to find any water to be able to drink and you're all going to uh, thirst to death. There's so many different things that happen. We're there in Oceanside and on Thursday, get up in the morning and Kelly had coffee, we're overlooking the ocean, it's beautiful, and I look way out at sea and there is a plume of smoke coming up. But all you can see is the water. So there's the water and it looks like the sea is on fire. You know, it's like, where is this smoke coming from? Okay, and then you deduce really quick, well, it must be a, a, a boat and must have caught in fire. And, and sure enough, pretty soon, all of a sudden, the, the Coast Guards are coast, going all day long, just going out, dropping uh, uh, divers into the water, looking for the body. And it ended up, it was a fisherman's boat from Oceanside Harbor going to Carlsbad, uh, barely made it into the Carlsbad waters and, and uh, his boat caught fire. And it'll know why or anything else but somebody coming by noticed it they got out there they put the fire out but there's no body and they don't know if it's just the owner if he had other people and so the search goes on all day long and so everybody's talking about it and we walk over there and seeing what was happening and and all that going on but all day long I just kept thinking about this family I found out the next day that they had to stop you know looking for him and and they never found they never recovered the body but I was just thinking of his wife. I was thinking of his family. I'm just thinking of, there's, there's one of those times where the things like this happening all the time. is like, where is God in the midst of that? Just went out to go fishing. What's the big deal? And they end up dead, drowning out in the water in that way. And it was soon after that, we had walked down to that area of the, the other end of the harbor there, and I found something I really love, an acai smoothie with a little bit of granola they mix in. It was, it, was, it was epic. I went back every day <laughs> at noon. That was my lunch. It was, it was awesome. But anyways, we met, this, uh, we met this gal who had this little one-year-old uh, little girl that she was pushing in her little uh, stroller, and uh, she was a heroin addict. And you can tell, you can see her arms are just covered with all the scars and the needle marks and everything else, and her, her baby is what first caught her attention because probably one-year-old little girl, uh, the, you know, you'd smile at her and just do the cutest smile back but so sunburnt on her face where her face was crusty from it. And her heart just broke and was just like, you know, she can do, she can make her choices and do whatever she wants. But this poor baby, and it just really struck her heart. What do we do? We talked about it. And so the next day when we had gone back to get my acai smoothie, she was there again sitting at the table. And so we sat next to her at this next table and trying to catch her eye and wanted to talk with her. And 
and all of a sudden we hear she was just throwing up right there on the table on the floor and, and all over the place. And so I walked over to her table and she apologized and I said, no, don't worry about that. And uh, I said, you, you okay? And the first thing she looked up and she was completely out of it and she says, I can't take care of my baby. I'm not in the right place to be able to care for my baby. And just like, oh my gosh. And so as I start talking with her, Kelly goes into the shop and is just asking about her and see, does anybody know her, know that how we can really help her? And, and so I'm asking how we can help her. And, and uh, they, somebody had already called the police and the fire department. Paramedics were coming to at least do a wellness check on the baby and, and her. And so, uh, and so as I'm talking with her, and I said, she, uh, Kelly heard me say, so you need to go to, you want to go to Motel 6. She had stayed there before. And... Uh, so I see Kelly start doing signs behind there. <laughs> so I'm getting the hieroglyphics and, you know, everything else from that. And I realize that the police are, that they're coming. And so I just kept talking with her. And uh, so she was asking, you know, could you do something? I said, well, actually, somebody else around you cared enough that they did do something. They called the police. And she's trying to get up and can barely stand and uh, ends up, they end up talking with her and trying to help her out and, and doing that. But again, another case situation. I'm thinking of this little baby being brought into the world with pretty difficult situations, pretty difficult start. And where does that go? And where is God in the midst of each of these, uh, each of these things? This is known, what we're talking about, it's known as theodicy in theology, theodicy. And it means the vindication of God. Not that God needs to be vindicated, but it's what we try to do to vindicate why would God allow this to happen. And so the Odyssey is the answer to the question of why God permits evil. Or as the great philosopher Lex Luthor said in Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, if God is all powerful, he cannot be all good. And if he's all good, then he cannot be all powerful. And so it's this whole argument of the problem of evil, or at least philosophical ways of trying to figure out how does evil, if God didn't create evil, how did it just start? How does it exist? Why does it exist? And so that's kind of what's talked about. But oftentimes we don't know how to answer it and where to begin with that problem. Again, somebody comes to you and said, my child just died. Where is your God now? That's a tough, that, that's just absolutely just a tough one. They just lost their home or lost their livelihood or lost their uh, spouse. And they, and they say, Christian, where is your God in the midst of this? And if we're honest, we're also questioning the same thing. When life, basically, when we're faced with frowning consequence, consequences in our own, in our own lives, and a lot of times what we'll do is we come up with, there's three main dodges that takes place. They're not answers, they're, they're dodges. We kind of ditch the situation and, and try to vindicate God, but in a little bit of a crazy way. And so the first one is the, the two wills argument, that God has two wills. He has what's called the sovereign will, but he also has this thing called the permissive will, which is when God allows things, he doesn't want to happen, but he allowed it to take place. And it's a way that we try to describe what God is doing. And to that, I would say, no. We find too many scriptures that said, God decrees all things to come to pass. See, what God wants, he gets. And he does whatever pleases him. And realize that he's not running for God, he is God. And so that lands in the category of his sovereignty. Now as I say that, and you might be in a hurting situation, I'm not trying to say it in a callous way, so stick with me as we continue to kind of walk through uh, each of these, that there's something better. The second one is the powerful enemy argument. It says when good things happen, that's God. But when bad things happen in my life, that's the devil. Nope. The devil is on a short leash. And in Job chapter 1, we realize that Satan has to get permission from God before he can act and do anything. And what's fascinating to me about the whole book of Job, if you just read chapter 1, a lot of the middle chapters are just bad advice from friends. Chapter 42, pretty great as it, everything wraps up with some cool results and all of that for his life. But he's never told why. It never answers the question of why in the first chapter did he lose his children? Did he lose his property? Did he lose? He was like one of the, what we would picture an oil sheik today. He was a very wealthy man back in that time period. And so with that, we, he never gets that, that answered. His friends are trying to figure it out. He's trying to figure out. There's no answer by the end of it. And we realize, and if you've lived long enough, you realize sometimes God just doesn't answer you. 
And he might not. What are you going to do about it? That's what I ask. Where do you, where do you land then if, if there isn't an answer for everything? The third one is God depends on your faith argument. God depends on your faith argument. It says, if you believe enough, you'll get healed or whatever else. Or if you hadn't spoken those certain words into existence. And we've heard that phrase before. We see so many times in scripture though that God's response to a situation or a healing is based solely on his grace, his mercy, and his love. One of the three or all of the three. But that's what it's based upon. You get four guys that have the idea, they got a friend who's a paralytic, they hear this healer's in town, they go up on the roof, they get the dust away, the dirt away off the, they got that move, they take the big chunk of livestone, they pull it off, dirt's coming in, <laughs> the people inside there, and they <laughs> drop that dude right, right down in front of them, and in the whole story there, and, and Jesus touches and, and heals him. But it had nothing to do with that man's faith, before, during, or after. Nothing in the story, even hints to this guy, whether he had faith, didn't have faith, didn't say nothing about his faith. That, that isn't the issue. That's not what it's always dependent upon. We're, we look at the Israelites in our, in, our, in our story here, and we're thinking, wait, they're telling God he's unrighteous in his dealings towards them. They're demanding, give us water to drink instead of stopping and praying hey god oh that's right this this just happened a couple chapters back just a couple towns back we were thirsty we finally got to the water it was bitter we couldn't drink from it we complained and murmured to moses and to god and he shows up by telling moses throw this log into the water and it becomes sweet and they all get to drink from it so maybe god would do that again so maybe if we just call out to him and say hey could you give us water they don't even think about that. No, it's give us water to drink. It's demanding of that. This is the height of arrogance. As if something is owed to them. It's a lack of humility. It's prayerlessness. It's a number of things. And, well, you and I, we do the same thing. We don't come out and say, God, do this. We're, we're much more reserved than that. We, we, we know, how to, we, we know that, that's too, too direct to just tell God, do something, right? But we're equally mad when he doesn't meet our expectations, equally mad. Do we think that God owes us? Does God owe you anything? Again, we might say, how dare these Israelites? But I think if we listen carefully to their whispers of 3,500 years ago, you would hear them whisper, it takes one to know one. See, when something happens that we know is beyond our control, now let me pause, I said it that way specifically because all things are out of our control, but there are certain things that happen that we know we're not in control. Now we got to pray, you know, and that's a lot of times when we'll resort to, to then praying to God and realize, okay, I can't do anything, you know, my shoulders are pinned against the wall, whatever, I don't see any other way out, maybe I should pray. But the accusation assumes that God should run the universe with me at the center of it. This is the key to the where was God response. And that's the issue. Where is God? Where was God? Is he even around? Is he even here? And I like that verse 6 says, by the way, God's standing right on top of the rock. They can't see him, but, but, but that's where he is. That's where his presence is. They, in, the, in the New Testament, we look back to the Old Testament. I wish I lived back in Old Testament time. They got to see God move in this cloud by day, this fire by night. They got to see these things in that way. And here's God standing in front of them. They don't see him. So they, they had to deal with the same things that we had to here. There's two tracks you can go down. There's the God-centered view when this takes place, the thumbs up, thumbs down view. If my assumption is that God is good and I exist for his glory, then I should say to God, you do with me whatever you will in order to bring glory to yourself. Then when the bad report comes and my assumption is this is happening because of his infinite wisdom knows that this circumstance in my life is what will maximize his glory. So my prayer is, will you give me grace to endure this circumstance so that I might maximize your glory through my life? I've been faced with that. 
I've used this illustration many times, but it was probably the hardest for me when my mom died. She was 47. I was 21, two month, three months before Kelly and I got married. So there was a lot happening in life, an important kind of, you know, places where you put your flag down in life of getting married and, you know, those things. You're starting your own family and wanting mom to be there for that, and she dies of breast cancer. And in the midst of crying out to God and everything else, where, where our conversation ended was, I don't get, you know, it started with, I don't get this, this makes no sense, and just mad at God, just what are you thinking, how is this going to help, two younger sisters still at home, you know, it's just like, how in any way is this, is this a good thing? And at the end of it, and I remember it was at a memorial service, it was difficult, but it was right afterwards, I just really felt him asking me the question, will you still trust me even in this? It's like, of course I will, God. I want to be a fair weather friend. No, I, of course I still love you. Of course I still trust you, even though I don't get it. Even if you never get it, this side of heaven? Yeah. And it's coming to that, that place of being able to not only, yes, I believe in God, but truly being able to live it out at those times of our lives to be able to say, okay, I don't get it. And I'm upset and I don't like it. And it doesn't make any sense to me, but... You are God and I am not. You are sovereign, I am not. I trust in you. Can't wait to hear what the result is one day. The me-centered view, a little bit different. God, you exist to bring me glory and me comfort and me happiness. And you're not doing your job well right now. (laughs) Sound familiar? (laughs) Again, we wouldn't say it that clear, but that's the sin at the heart of it. That's the sin at the heart of it. We just only see when everything is done rightly by God, when our wants and our desires and our comforts are the end result, that's when we're, that's when we're blessed by God and we're ready to tell all of our friends, this is the end result. It's what we make Christian movies out of, right? Of when everything and we live happily ever after stories. That's, that's, what, we, that's what we thrive on. This whole situation is when we have too low of a view on God and too high of a view on us, on ourselves, then we end up doing the exact same thing. Remember God was putting them to the test, not vice versa. We have that last couple of chapters. He's already named it, I think three times is the fourth time, of with us, I am testing you. With the manna, he said that. With the bitter water, he said that. This time he said that, and I think there's one more. But each and every time, it's, well... It's a 40-year test, actually. It's a 40 to, I will be testing you. He lets them know, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to be testing you. Will you trust in me if this happens? Will you trust in me if that happens? Where are you thirsty? Where are you hungry? Where are you whatever? And he's he's laying these out. It's going to take 40 years to be able to, to, to do that. Not because he's mean. No. Exactly the opposite. He wants us to be conformed in the image of his son. And he'll continue working in that fashion. But God was putting them to the test. And yet what's happening in our chapter here is them putting God to the test, them putting God on the stand, them asking God, telling God to prove himself. It's what we do. God, why do you allow war? God, why do you allow evil? Why did you allow this or that to take place in my life? We're doing the same thing. We're putting God on the stand just because we don't understand it and won't accept that his mind is a little bit better than our minds and what he does and that he's purposeful and all of that. And we accuse him of that, placing him on the stand and we want an answer from him. We do the same thing. Instead of this being the Supreme Court, his court, it turns into the people's court, which turns into a kangaroo court. Think about it. When we put God to the test, it's just as satanic as when the devil did it to Jesus in the wilderness and tried to get Jesus to prove himself. If you are the son of God, then throw yourself down from here. Jesus refused to submit to the devil's trial. But uh, not because he couldn't pass it. Obviously, he could have done that. Watch this. And just did it, right? And so we know that he could have, but because the trial itself was wrong. And, and Moses is going to write later on in his last book in the Deuteronomy, he reminds him of this event. 
You must not, this is pretty clear, you don't really need to know the Hebrew original language as anything else. You must not test the Lord your God as you did when you complained at Massa. That's this place right here. It's just a clear warning. You must not test the Lord that way, except that you and I probably do it on a daily basis when we're not trusting in him. And then as I say all of that, this is God's test, not their test. And I make all of that argument. And then God, to our amazement, turns around and went ahead and gave them the hearing that they wanted. Okay, then I'll show myself strong on your behalf. He submitted himself to judgment. Not their judgment, but his own. It's interesting. God will do that for them up until chapter 20. In chapter 20, they get the law. They have no law. In the law, we're going to get the to-dos and the to-don'ts. We're going to get the obedient, how to be obedient, how to be disobedient. you got to choose, but it's very clear. It's pretty black and white as he lays it all out. Not a whole bunch of gray, but the law hasn't come yet. They don't have the law. And so he's dealing very graciously with them. I remember when our kids were small and Kelly and I were raising them that we'd get into situations where they, the kids might not have known. It was definitely a wrong situation. Maybe at grandma's house. And at our house, it's very clear. We didn't just put up everything. It's like, these are your toys. These aren't. Don't touch them. If you do, you'll pay the wrath of dad. And so with that, we just kind of make that clear. But if we're at somebody else's house and they didn't know it was a no-touchy kind of thing, then there's, it's not, you don't jump in with discipline. You get down eye to eye to them and say, these you don't touch. And then if they do, they feel the heat. And so with that, they were kind of in the same place. And so until we get there to chapter 20, then God's being very gracious in dealing with them in that way. And so they're putting God on the stand. He says, I'll take the stand. Watch this. See who I am. See what I do. See that I am present. Because that's their whole thing, right? Is God even around? Well, let me show you that I'm around. And that's what he's revealing here. What did the water from the rock prove? It proved everything about God that the Israelites were calling into question. Like you might say, Brian, why, why is this story here? Okay, we, we've heard, we know there's different miracles, and this is, this is a great miracle, and they got water, but why, why is this here? Well, again, it's, it's, a God, it's that relationship issue between God and his people, and, and it, everything that they just called into question, he's going to answer. Did answer. They were demanding his provision. They were denying his protection. And they were doubting his presence. But the water flowing for the rock proved all these things. It proved God has the power to provide. The psalmist would talk about this story as the New Testament talks about it also. It was an event. It was an important event. And so the psalmist in Psalm 78 says in verse 15 and 16, He split open the rocks in the wilderness to give them water. And from a gushing spring, not just a spring, I like that, a gushing spring. So there wasn't this little trickle, it wasn't a hit with a stick, and the rock breaks open, and there was kind of a cistern or a pocket of water for them. No, no, the way it's described here, in the middle of the wilderness, give them water, gushing spring, he made streams pour from the rock, making waters flow down like a babbling brook no like a river there was so much water for two million people to be able to drink from and so with that it was an event that the psalmist remembers and looks back to remember that Jehovah Jireh God provides secondly God was also their protector instead of judging his people for their sins especially for their unbelief here he submitted himself to judgment so that they could live and thirdly the rock was the proof of God's presence The Israelites wanted to know if God was with them or not. Well, there he was, their savior, standing on the rock. Now, the Bible talks a lot about uh, God being a rock. It's tsar in the Hebrew, T-S-A-R. It looks like in the way we would phonetically write it out. But he is the rock of Israel, is one quote. The rock whose works are perfect. The rock was a fortress and a refuge. The rock of our salvation, firm foundation. Each of these are what they're, what they're talking about there. And so the rock that Moses struck with his rod was a symbol of God and his salvation. How so? Continue to listen as we move forward. These last two things. Number one, the rock is Christ because like the rock, it showed how God would submit to the blow of his own justice so that out of him would flow life for his people. 
Christ was struck with divine judgment and punishment. Now you could say, Brian, are you making that up? Like, I hear there's different typologies in the Bible, and, and pastors are very liberal oftentimes of coming up with different types. This is a type of this. This is a type of that. Here's where I land when it comes to typologies. If it says it's a type, then it's a type. If I make it up about a type, I'm going to tell you I'm making it up. This could look this way. It could be that. And if somebody says that, I said, yeah, it could. We don't know, but we could. But this is one where Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 so clearly this is the most clear using this story and, uh, of God bringing water from a rock in the wilderness. He quotes this story and he says, and that rock was Christ. So it's not a guess. There's no guessing of that. It's all of a sudden what 1 Corinthians 10 makes us do is like, wait, the rock in the wilderness was Christ. You go back and read the story. No, wait a minute. If this was symbolic of Christ, Christ getting hit, water coming out, what does that all mean? It makes you relook at that. And so that's why I think, what a great story, what an important story it is because of the commentary or the, the, the typology that, that Paul brings this in on that there was much deeper than what, what, meets the, what meets the eye. Oh, so that's why in the book of Numbers, when this all happens again and they lose their faith again in, in God and they're not trusting in him and they're thirsty again and still part of the wilderness in the book of Numbers, they complain against Moses. Moses calls out to God and God says what? Speak to the rock. What does he do? He takes a stick and goes and smacks the rock. And if I can say this, God got ticked because he did. And you wonder in reading it, it's just like, why is he so upset? Like, like he just, like he, he had a bad day, you know, it's just, you got two million people whining, complaining to you. Of course you got, got to hit something, you know, and so rock was, why not? You did it that way last time and you come up with all these reasons of, of why maybe it was okay for Moses. No, because God had this whole analogy going. Now, he's not going to explain until a little bit later on, New Testament, Paul, give it to him that the rock was Christ. And so now bringing back in, Christ would be smacked once. See, the last chapter we had the manna that, and that represented Jesus coming down from heaven, the type that Jesus himself gives in John chapter 6. And, and, and now in this chapter here, all of a sudden we have not Christ's manna that came, but Christ was stricken there on the cross. That's where he took this for us. And so you can see why the father was so mad at Moses of no, 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 no. You're ruining the whole analogy here. He only needs to go to the cross once. He only needs to be struck once in that way for life to be able to come flowing out of him. Spiritual life becoming that living water that isn't just for you know, you know, drink to, to quench a, thir uh, a physical thirst, but to quench a spiritual thirst. And it's just like, and so Moses didn't get to go into the promised land as you maybe remember. So, lastly, the rock is also Christ because it flowed with the water of life as I just mentioned. One commentator, I just thought it was interesting. This is one where, eh, I don't know, but I thought it was really good. As he was hanging on the cross and his side was pierced, make sure that he was dead, and what comes out? Blood and water. And as they said that, the blood shed for our sins and the water, not simply to prove that Jesus died on the cross, though that's what the Roman soldier had in mind, but to show that by his death he gives life. I just thought that was good. As that he came to bring that living water and then that's what we have. His blood to cleanse our sins, the living water to give us life. And I think maybe a beautiful ending to that. This time I'm going to explain something. I'm going to invite up our worship team. And so it's not the end of the service because we're going to do one more thing. And so for our cameras, I'm going to let them know that we're not, do we still film third service? Where? Okay, so for you guys listening in, we have to cut off the live feed because at the very end, we have one of our field workers and his families going uh, back out to the, uh, uh, to the mission field and we need to talk about that uh, privately. So right after the song, uh, it's gonna go black for you and if you guys can just, we'll sit back down and uh, hear from them and be able to pray them off as they go. So um, allow me to pray. Father, we, uh, we think of, oh, there's been so many times, too many times to count where we lost our trust in you. Uh, we just got focused in on ourselves, didn't understand what you were doing. Forgive us, God. Forgive us for those times where we didn't stop and even think about praying. Forgive us for those times where we just, we just blew it. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness. But God, we do trust in you. 
And even though we don't see you, even though you're not tangible to us here, God, you have worked in so many beautiful ways in our lives, and we've seen it. We've seen your faithfulness, and we trust in that. We trust in you in these situations in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.